Book 3. 10. That summer, I lived in a house on the edge of sand dunes. My room was a low-ceilinged attic with a window that looked out on the dunes and the beach and the ocean. In the early morning, I could see the sun on the water and the silver foaming of the surf. The sun rose through the morning mist and burned the mist away, and then was the golden on the beach and white on Cape Cod houses, a few hundred yards on up the dunes, where dark scrub brush grew in the sandy earth. Gulls wheeled and called above the water and the sand, their wings stark white in the sun. I watched the gulls from the window of my room and from the porch of the house, and I painted them over and over again, using watercolors or washes of oils, painted their soarings into the sun, their wings in the wind, and their wide diving circles over the surface of the waves. Often I did not paint at all, but sat on the porch listening and watching, feeling the salt wind on my face, hearing the surf and the cries of the gulls. An artist needs time to do nothing but sit around and think and let ideas come to him, Jacob Kahn said to me one afternoon on that porch, after I had sat on a chair for hours, gazing at the sunlight on the water and the sand and the houses farther up along the dunes. Gertrude Stein said that once. She was an impossible human being, but she was wise. Now I understand the sunlight in paintings by Hopper. He gazed at the houses along the dunes. Yes, he said. That is Hopper's white sunlight. One day you will understand the sunlight in Monet and Van Gogh and Cezanne. Often in the early mornings I came out of the house and walked across the dunes to the beach. The dunes were cool then from the night. I wore sandals and shorts and a shirt and had on my teflon. Those mornings the beach was my synagogue and the waves and gulls were audience to my prayers. I stood on the beach and felt wind-blown sprays of ocean on my face and I prayed. Sometimes the words seemed more appropriate to this beach than to the synagogue on my street. One morning I finished praying and came back across the dunes and found Jacob Kahn on the porch. I was watching you, he said quietly. I used to pray once. Do you talk to God when you pray? Yes. I have lost that faculty. I cannot pray. I talk to God through my sculpture and my painting. That's also prayer. He smiled faintly, the morning sun on his face. The Rebbe said precisely that. You are following the party line, Asher Lev, but we know it is not the same thing, don't we? Sometimes in the mornings I came out onto the porch and saw him walking with his wife across the dunes. She was a shy, quiet woman with short white hair and soft brown eyes. Her name was Tanya, and she spoke English with a heavy Russian accent. She loved to sit on the porch reading books in Russian and in French. I would watch them walking together across the dunes. She came to below his shoulders in height, and often he would bend toward her as they walked. I would watch them together, then turn my eyes away and stare out across the waves at the distant joining of water and sky. I would not eat food that was not kosher, so they brought a table and a chair and a portable electric stove and a refrigerator into my room, and I prepared my own food. Mostly, I ate canned foods and hard-boiled eggs and raw vegetables. On occasion, as I sat at the table eating, I wondered how my father had managed to eat during all his years of travel. After breakfast, Jacob Kahn and I would set up our easels at the edge of the dunes and paint. He taught me how the Impressionists had painted light, and what Cezanne had done with color and form. Once a sailboat came close to the shore and was circled by the gulls. Using washes of oils, he showed me how John Moraine might have painted that. I had seen Moraine's watercolors in museums. Now I began to understand their lines of tension, their fluidity and power. I began to understand too, though only with difficulty, why and how he painted as he did. The canvas was a two-dimensional field, he said. Any attempt to convert it to an object of three dimensions was an illusion and a falsehood. The only honest way to paint today was either to represent objects that were recognizable and at the same time integral to the two-dimensional nature of the canvas, or to do away with objects entirely and create paintings of color and texture and form, paintings that translated the volumes and voids in nature into fields of color, paintings in which the solids were flattened and the voids were filled, and the planes were organized into what Hans Hoffmann called complexes. I watched him paint and began to understand what he meant. But I could not paint that way myself. I needed hands and faces and eyes, though for a while now I had not needed them to be three-dimensional. You are too religious to be an abstract expressionist, he'd said to me one morning. We are ill at ease with the universe. We are rebellious and individualistic. We welcome accidents in painting. You are emotional and sensual, but you are also rational. That is your Ladover background. 
It is not in my nature to urge a person to give up his background and culture in order to become a painter. That is because it is not in my nature to be a fool. A man's painting either reflects his culture or is a comment upon it, or it is merely a decoration or photography. You do not have to be an abstract expressionist in order to be a great painter. In any event, by the time you reach your 20s, abstract expressionism may be gone as an important movement in American painting. Though I do not think so. I think people will paint this way for a thousand years. Toward noon, with the sun hot and glaring overhead, we would bring our easels and paints into the house and cross the dunes to the beach. We would swim in the cold ocean water. I learned to swim that summer with the help of Jacob Kahn. He was a powerful swimmer. I would stand on the beach and watch him swimming off in the distance, his arms flashing in the sunlight. He had bronzed quickly in the sun. I had burned. Part of my first week in that house I spent realizing how fair-skinned I really was. Sometimes, standing on that beach, I would remember the beach along the lake in the Berkshires where my mother and I had walked years ago. It seemed another world now, just as my street seemed another world, cold and distant from the warmth of dunes and summer sun. I wondered where my mother was and what she was doing. When the wondering edged into pain, I came off the beach into the water and swam beneath the sun and the wheeling gulls. In the afternoons, we went off by ourselves and painted alone. I painted in my room or outside on the porch. He painted in his studio, a huge room that took up most of the interior of the house. It had tall windows and was always filled with light. He was painting large canvases, and they lay stacked against one of the walls. I had helped him stretch those canvases, setting up a platform with horses and plywood, placing the stretchers on top of the plywood, rolling the canvas onto the stretchers, and cutting it and tacking it, fighting wrinkles and dangerous tightness. It had taken us almost a week to stretch those canvases. Now he was filling them with color and form. I painted the dunes and the beach and the vast sweep of ocean beyond. I painted the gulls and the sun and the pale blue arc of the sky. I painted my mother on a lakefront. I painted my father eating an indistinct meal at an indistinct table near a window overlooking vague, garbled buildings and blurred lights. One afternoon I painted a portrait of myself in my fisherman's cap, with my long red earlocks and the tufts of red hair on my cheeks and chin, and my eyes dark but flecked with tiny spots of light. I looked at the portrait and I tucked my earlocks behind my ears. In the evenings, Jacob Kahn and I often walked along Commercial Street. He looked at me that evening when I came down after my private supper and said nothing. We drove to the Chrysler Museum in his new Buick. Inside one of the rooms, he spent twenty minutes explaining the structure of a huge Picasso to me. Then we came out into the night and walked along Commercial Street. It was crowded with traffic and people. This is a street I like, he said, but in five years it will be for tourists. Still, it is a good street. He wore dungarees and a light shirt and sandals. People greeted him repeatedly as we went along the street. He took me into some of the galleries. The owners all knew him. He introduced me to everyone who spoke to him. In one of the galleries on Commercial Street, we stood in front of a series of canvases, and he said to me, I do not like geometric abstraction. It has no contact with our time. It is not in touch with that which is human and man. Mondrian is a great artist, but he cannot express the feeling that is necessary in a painting if I am to care for it. A man came over to us, tall and tanned, with dark hair and pale blue eyes. They shook hands. The man was an artist. He had a show in a nearby gallery. Had Jacob Kahn seen it? No. He ought to see it. Who's the boy? Asher Lev? Nice to meet you, kid. Had Jacob Kahn heard the word that the heavy money would probably be in Tokyo in five to ten years? That was the word. The whole art world was going to shift to Tokyo. That was where the next center of art would be. New York was through. He himself was thinking of moving to Tokyo in a year or two. Nice to meet you, Jack. Nice to meet you, kid. Catch the show if you can. He went out of the gallery into the crowded street. Every trade has them, Jacob Kahn said. They are called whores. We walked along the street in the warm night. There was the salt smell of the ocean, and the dark, star-filled sky, and the odors of broiling fish and meat from the open-air restaurants. We walked together a long time, then we drove home. We stood on the porch of the house and looked across the dunes to the ocean. We could hear the distant thunder of the surf along the shore. Asher Lev, Jacob Kahn said softly, do not become a whore. I stared at him. His face was indistinct in the dark night. It is not likely that you will starve as an artist. It is also not likely that you will become very rich. Anna tends to be optimistic with her artists. In any event, poor or rich, do not become a whore. 
I told him I had no intention of becoming a whore. No, you are already on the way, Asherlev. I would not object if you did that to your payos out of conviction. But you did it out of shame and cowardice. That is the beginning of artistic whoring. I felt my throat thicken. My father wears his payos behind his ears. Some Ladover Hasidim do not even wear payos. They aren't that important to us. Asher Lev, an artist who deceives himself, is a fraud and a whore. You did that because you were ashamed. You did that because wearing payos did not fit your idea of an artist. Asher Lev, an artist, is a person first. He is an individual. If there is no person, there is no artist. It is of no importance to me whether you wear your payos behind your ears or whether you cut off your hair entirely and go bald. I am not a defender of payos. Great artists will not give a damn about your payos. They will only give a damn about your art. The artists who will care about your payos are not worth caring about. You want to cut off your payos, go ahead, but do not do it because you think it will make you more acceptable as an artist. Good night, Asherlev. Tomorrow morning I will begin to teach you what Kedinsky tried to accomplish. I will also show you why abstract expressionists are indebted to Chaim Soutin. He peered at me intently in the darkness. Asher Lev, did I upset you? Yes. Good. I spoke bluntly. It is not in my nature to be circumspect about important matters. I was quiet. Good night, Asher Lev. He went into the house. I stood alone on the porch and stared out across the sands at the water and the night. There was a wind now from the ocean, cool and damp against my face. The porch ran the length of the house and was screened off from the outside. The darkness throbbed softly with the earth life of an ocean shore. I heard the tapping of insects upon the screen. A mosquito buzzed nearby, strangely loud in the pulsing night. Distant laughter floated toward me, borne by the night wind. I felt hot, and I shivered, and I was ashamed. We did not talk again about my earlocks. I left them as they had been, loose and long against the sides of my face. Nor did we talk about how we spent Shabos. I would not paint on Shabos. I spent Shabos mornings praying and reviewing the Torah reading. I spent Shabos afternoons studying a book on Hasidus I had brought with me. Jacob Kahn spent Shabos mornings on the beach with his wife, and Shabos afternoons painting. On Tisha B'Av, I read the Book of Lamentations aloud to myself in my room. I fasted and would not paint. I sat on the porch in the morning, watching the sun on the sand. Tanya Khan sat nearby reading. She looked up at one point, and in her Evie accent said quietly, When will you be able to eat, Asher? After dark. You are a skin and bones. You should not starve yourself. I did not respond. My younger brother was very religious, like you. Everyone admired him, but the Nazis killed him anyway. It did not do him much good to be so religious. She went back to her reading. I sat gazing across the dunes at the rushing surf. Jacob Kahn came out onto the porch from the house. He brought with him the odors of turpentine and oil colors. He wore shorts and sandals, and there was paint on his arms and chest and white hair, and on the shorts and sandals. He looked somber. That went well. I am satisfied. I will hate it in the morning, but now I am satisfied. My little Hasid is still fasting? I nodded. I will wash up and we will take a walk. Do you have strength for a walk? Yes. He went back into the house and came out a few minutes later wearing clean shorts and a light shirt. There is paint in your mustache, his wife said. Yes, we will let it remain for a while. A testament to a day of good work. Come, Asher. We left his wife on the porch reading and started across the dunes. The sand was hot. I felt it shifting and sliding beneath my sandals, felt it on my feet and between my toes. Along the edge of the beach lay scattered remnants of the night. Beer cans, bits of paper, a prophylactic. Jacob Kahn left his sandals on the beach and walked along the surf, and I walked beside him, keeping my feet out of the water. The sun burned overhead. I felt it burning my face and arms. You are fasting for the destruction of the temple? Jacob Kahn said. Yes. And for the death of the six million? I've been thinking of the six million, yes. My father used to fast. I could never understand the point of it. I fasted a few times when I was young, but when I came to Paris I stopped because it meant nothing to me. It meant nothing to me when I lived in Berlin in the twenties, and again in Paris in the thirties. I've had long discussions with the Rebbe about fasting. I have lost the faculty of appreciating such an act of faith. He stopped walking and stared out across the ocean. Sometimes I think all that water is blood. It is a strange feeling. 
He was silent. The wind blew through his white hair. I saw the flecks of paint on his face, luminous in the sun. He crouched down along the edge of the surf, where the sand was moist but untouched now by the encroaching film of water. His hands gathered sand into a small mound. I watched his fingers begin to work on the moist sand. It pleases me that you have chosen not to abandon things that are meaningful to you. I do not have many things that are meaningful to me, except my doubts and my fears, and my art. His fingers were shaping the sand, working swiftly, molding. I saw a face come to life. I saw eyes and a nose and a lips. It was his own face. He was sculpting a self-portrait out of the sand along the edge of the foaming surf. The sightless eyes stared out across the water. He rose slowly to his feet and gazed down at the face. I would not like to die too soon. There are many things I still want to do. I would like to live beyond eighty. Monet did it. Renoir did it. Picasso will do it. Nothing will stop that Spanish genius from reaching eighty. I bet even Chagall will do it. In Paris, sometimes we thought Chagall would not even reach forty. Yes, I would like to live beyond eighty. He looked at me and shook his head. Asher Lev, sometimes I find your presence a little... upsetting. You carry with you too much of my own past. Come, walk with me along the beach. We will look at your hopper sunlight on the houses. You will contemplate God, and I will contemplate futility. He smiled wryly. I do not enjoy myself when I am like this. But there is nothing to be done. It is in my nature to be this way from time to time. We walked along the surf, and then on up across the hot dunes. We walked in silence, and overhead the gulls circled and called in the hot afternoon sky. We came through the scrub brush and looked at the sunlight on the houses. I cannot do it, I heard him say. No one can do it. He gazed wide-eyed at the blinding sunlight. Even Monet could not do it. And he had the greatest eye of all. He turned and stared back down across the dunes at the beach and the distant mound of moist sand that wore his face. My blood offering, he murmured, but it will not help. We walked back to the house. He went to bed early that night, and in the morning he would not rise. He is in a mood, his wife said calmly. Once in a while he has a mood. She would not let me see him. I painted alone on the porch of the house. I painted his face in the sand with the surf tearing at it. His wife came out onto the porch and gazed at the painting. Once in a while he remembers the sculptures he left behind in Paris when we ran from the Nazis. They melted it all down. Ten years of sculpture. She looked at me. You are very good. A good painter and a good person. Be careful. The world is not nice to good people. She sat down on a chair and opened a book. He would not come out of his room all that day. The next morning, a car pulled up to the house, and a tall, brown-haired man stepped out and came toward the porch. Tanya Khan greeted him and introduced us. He looked at the painting I was working on, then looked at me. I knew his name. I had seen his paintings in museums. He went into the house. Four more painters came over that day, one of them from as far away as Woods Hole. The others were all in Provincetown for the summer. I knew their names. Shortly before noon the next day, a cab stopped at the house, and Anna Schaefer hurried inside. She greeted me briefly, and then went off with Tanya Khan. They were gone a long time. The cab waited near the house. I stood on the porch watching the gulls. Had there been birds on the trees along my street? Had I ever seen them wheeling and circling? I could not remember. Behind me, a door opened and closed softly. I turned. "'Are you having a good summer?' Anna Schaefer asked. "'Yes.' I'm glad. Will he be all right? Yes, it passes, but it is unpleasant while he has it. He is like a light that is dying. It takes a few days. You are doing good work this summer? I think so. Jacob Kahn reports to me that he is satisfied. Now I must take that cab back to Hyannis and see if there's a flight to New York. Goodbye, Asherlev. Be especially kind to your teacher. He is filled with memories of unpleasant things these days. She went off in the cab. Tanya Khan came out onto the porch. He is better. Anna has a way of helping him. She sat down on a chair and opened her book. He has always come out of it. Of course, there is a chance he may not. One learns to live with fear. He came out onto the porch that evening and watched the sky grow dark. Then he went inside. Later, as I passed his studio on the way to my room, I saw he had turned on a set of floodlights and was painting, stripped to the waist, a huge canvas toned in a wash of burnt sienna. 
He was painting in a frenzy, filling the surface with crimson and black forms. I watched him for a while, then went up to my room. In the morning, we painted together. We did not talk about the past three days. When we went down to the beach before noon to swim, I saw him staring at the sand beyond the curving line of surf. The sand was damp and smooth. He went into the water and swam a long time, far away from the shore. Then he came out of the water and stood next to me, dripping, his white mustache hair wild and wet, droplets of water clinging to his mustache. I will make it past eighty, he said, if I can keep from thinking too much about the past. That was a good swim for an impossible old man of seventy-three. We walked back together across the dunes to the house. The following week I received a letter from my mother. She was well. My father was working very hard. She urged me to take good care of myself and not to forget that I was a Jew. She sent her good wishes to Jacob Kahn. The letter was postmarked from Zurich. The previous letters I had received from her had all been postmarked Vienna, Paris, and Bucharest. Often that summer I lay in my bed trying to sleep and found myself thinking of my parents. I would see them gazing out train windows at misty hills and dark mountains and tiny villages set in green valleys. I would see them on the boulevards of great cities, walking together, my father, tall and bearded, dressed in his neat dark clothes. My mother, short, slight, her eyes warm and alive to the sounds around her, the two of them together, my father's head inclined toward her, listening to her words. I wondered what they talked about during all those days of travel. Russian Jews? The Yeshivos my father was bringing to life? Their strange son? My father's certainty of the trouble I would one day bring upon them? I would lie awake in the night seeing them together and finally I would sleep, and sometimes there would be dreams. One day in the third week of August, Jacob Kahn took me to Hyannis, and we spent part of the day visiting galleries. Two days later, we drove to Boston to see a Cubist exhibit. All the way back in the car, Jacob Kahn talked about the exhibit and about the Cubists he had known in Paris before the First World War. We changed the eyes of the world, Asher Lev. Picasso and Brack with painting, and Jacob Kahn with sculpture. Picasso was frightening. We met and talked, all of us, and thought of this or that idea. Picasso would go back to his studio, and in a few hours he had it all worked out on a canvas. He is a genius. He can use up a lifetime of ideas of an ordinary good painter in a few weeks. People used to hide their canvases from him. There's something demonic about such a gift, Asher Lev. Demonic, or divine, I do not know which. Giotto, Michelangelo, Picasso. It'll be 300 years before the world assimilates what has happened to art as a result of Picasso and the Cubists. He smiled delightedly. Ah, the stories I can tell. You are an old gossip, his wife said, looking up. She had been sitting beside him on the front seat, reading. Yes, he said, I love gossip. It is one of my more delicious weaknesses. A few days later, he drove me to the Provincetown docks and let me out. I wandered along the waterfront, sketching the boats and the gulls and the boys diving and swimming. I watched them diving and swimming, and I sketched their young bodies in the sunlight. Then I stopped sketching for a while and stood at the end of a long wooden pier and watched them in the water, swimming smoothly with the liquid ease of a fish. I envied them their freedom. I went from the pier and walked slowly along the streets of the town, narrow, crowded streets filled with cafes and restaurants and souvenir shops. I came into a small aquarium and watched sharks swim about behind thick glass. I sketched the twisting of their bodies and the hideousness of their mouths. People gathered around me, and there were murmurs of awe. Here is my gift, I thought, publicly displayed. I drew without hesitation. I thought I heard someone applaud. I could not be certain. I saw a young boy of about eight leaning forward, watching. I signed one of the drawings, dated it, tore it from the sketchbook, and gave it to him. His eyes went wide. There was a soft ripple of laughter and approval. I went out into the sunlight and walked the streets. Sometime during the walking, I saw myself in the window of a restaurant and stared indifferently at my face and realized my side curls were behind my ears. I turned away and continued along the street. I went up a side street and sketched the faces of old women on the porches of small wooden houses. I sketched the faces of old men, wrinkled leathery faces, the faces of fishermen who knew intimately a kind of universe far from the street where I had grown up. Here on a street of Provincetown fishing families, I sketched people I had never known before, but with whom I felt a strange kinship. We all lived together on the same quicksilvery water and sand. I sketched their faces and gave some of the sketches away, and was rewarded with grateful smiles. Later that day, Jacob Kahn picked me up in front of the gallery where we had met the man he had called a whore. 
He looked at my face. You had a good day? He asked quietly. I showed him the sketches. He glanced through them and nodded. You had a good day, he said. I'm going to be an artist, I said. I'm going to be a great artist. You've been an artist for a long time, Asher Lev. We drove together through town. Early one morning at the end of August, a truck came up to the house. We loaded the paintings of the summer into the back and closed and locked the doors. We stood on the porch and watched the truck drive off. He is a careful driver, Jacob Kahn said. I've used him before. I did not say anything. Later we swam together and then I sat at the edge of the line of surf and made a sculpture of my face out of wet sand. Jacob Kahn watched me. It is very good, he said when I was done. We swam again, and when we came out of the water, the face had crumbled into a pile of soggy sand, dissolved by the surf. We stared at it, and I looked at Jacob Kahn. No, he said, I will not be ill again. I will never make it to eighty if I indulge myself too much with that illness. But I saw that face of sand in my sleep that night, and I woke and went to the window, and stared out at the dunes and thought I heard soft mocking laughter float toward me from the dark water beyond. Two days later, we drove back to New York, and my summer of water and sand came to an end.